Historia Regum Britannae, or History of the Kings of Britain, is an account of the history of the Britons. Starting with the Trojan migration to Britain and the inception of the British nation, and ends with the ascension of the Anglo-Saxons. The book contains an account of the invasion of Julius Caesar, as well as King Arthur, and is a central piece of literature for the matter of Britain. The History of the Kings was written by Geoffrey of Monmouth, or Griffith Ab Arthur, in 1136, and was commissioned by Walter Archdeacon of Oxford. This provided a pillar of historical reference for Britain's understanding of its past until the 16th century, when Italian-English papal agent and humanist scholar Polydor Virgil rewrote British history under the instruction of Henry VII, who wished to wield the history of Brutus and Arthur for himself exclusively. Geoffrey has been slandered ever since. This includes accusations of invention of the information which has subsequently led uh, the traditional British history to be censored and neglected. Contrary to those accusations, Geoffrey himself stated that the information for his chronicle was made available to him via the translation of a Breton script. Geoffrey's contemporary critics will say that no such document has been found. However, in 1917, eminent archaeologist Sir Flinders Petrie found the Breton document with a colophon attributed to Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, which vindicates Geoffrey of these alleged crimes. Petrie analysed this paper in his own paper, Neglected British History, and please stay tuned for a review of this document. Hi everybody, welcome back to the, either the Matter of Britain or Britain's Hidden History or wherever you're viewing this video. Um, so today we're going to be reviewing a, uh, a an article, a document which should have been the document which changed everything in the early 20th, early 20th century uh, to do with our topic, basically. Uh, this is um, by a, 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 a text analysis by a very famous Egyptologist, Sir Flinders Petrie. Um, who, you know, it, one of his lesser known elements of his career is that he spent a lot of time looking at um, what he calls neglected British history. Um, he's known for his Egyptology and his um, discovery of the proto Sinaitic script, which is uh, very important for us as well. Um, but he... I mean, the guy was hugely influential. Uh, he he was the, one of the first to to talk about uh, creating pottery sequences. Yeah. For, for chronologies he was one of the first to talk about you know uh, stratigraphy as well and measuring stratigraphy when doing excavations like just in terms of the basics of archaeology the guy was a pioneer mm. um but as you said uh, his surveying as well was a really big thing he did some of the first really good surveys of stonehenge and the great pyramid as well um yeah, yeah it's a, a, a huge force in in history and archaeology in the earliest 20th century yes absolutely absolutely that and um and you, you, because of the uh the enormity of this this um this guy uh it, the his his document and his um appreciation for the brutes history um should have changed should have changed everything i i think ross put it well um when he used to, he used to mention that this thing this topic was gaining a lot of interest um before the first world war and mm. yeah absolutely but um yeah so william matthews flinders petrie <laughs> yeah. we i mean it, this is going to be really good i think we we owe a bit to um to uh uh adrian gilbert for this one don't we um, oh, because yes. I think I think me, me and you both knew this document existed. Yes. Um, but Adrian Gilbert's brilliant new series he's doing on on uh, on neglect neglected Br British history. Um, he he mentioned this again and it gave us a kick up the bum, didn't it, to take a look at it, Adam? Yeah. yeah. So um, so thanks Adrian for that. Thanks, thanks a lot. Adrian. Uh, yeah, I'd recommend go and check out his his uh, new series yeah. for. Uh looking at the, in memory of Wilson and Blackett um, talking about this topic and, and uh, he's got loads and loads. He's blown my mind basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My and mind. on this topic in particular, he, yeah. each one seems to be getting better and better each time he does one as well. And it's, yeah. uh, it's fantastic stuff. Jeffrey of Monmouth, of course, in, the, in his prologue to uh, HRB, Historium Regium Britannia, yeah. Yeah. he, um, he states that all, pretty much everything in the book 
comes from a small Welsh book that he was given and that he decided to translate it, not as dry, dull Latin, but yeah. something homely that people could read. Um, and um, basically it has pretty much been denied since day one that he ever had a small Welsh book that he yeah he copied from he translated from and um the brutusilio um which many people say is is the welsh book or at least a version of the brutusilio a, a manuscript version of it uh uh is you say is jeffrey's book um but that has been denied by by many people um and it's been argued that it is just merely a, a latin abridgment of of jeffrey's work um and Petrie that makes a brilliant and very convincing argument for that not to be the case and to say that Jeffrey was telling the truth and the evidence is there in the text. And that's basically what this is, is a side-by-side -side analysis of uh, the brute manuscript that Petrie was working from and yeah. uh, Jeffrey of Monmouth, uh, with also Gildas and Nennius as well. Uh, so we can see, because there's no doubt that Jeffrey also probably used these two sources as well. Yeah, um, yeah. and, uh, as Petrie says, there's, uh, some other influence as well at certain points. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, so this introduction, he's basically talking about his, you know, he's, he's incredulous, you know, uh, Pete, you know, what, why aren't people talking about, uh, dark age, Welsh history, Brythonic history, mm. and, and why aren't they using this top, this text to do it? Yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's basically what he's saying on this first page. But obviously, it's yeah. up there if people want to pause and have a look themselves. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I think an important element of that is actually the um, the continuity between the throughout the British world on reciting this similar story and the the um, similarities between them. Because yeah, absolutely, yeah, you you can't expect that kind of continuity in a you know through that throughout that. Th those different regions you know it's, it's quite unless it's the truth or unless it's got truth to it you know it's so yeah he doesn't really um apply himself to any sort of political reasons why it might be ignored. no no not at all does he he he, to that, no. he is just literally incredulous and he says well the 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 only reason i think it's uh, oh, i can't point <laughs> uh in that paragraph break on the middle of the page he says yeah. i can only assume it's it's because of this idea that it's just an abridgment of Jeffrey and and nothing out, nothing more than that. And and when you yeah, when when um, Jeffrey is mentioned even today, that is the cap on the conversation, isn't it? Absolutely, it, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't go further than that? Um, and this is this is I think the only um, academic paper I've seen actually challenging this. You know, but apart from. Obviously, you know Wilson and Blackett, and you know, in our world, you know, the the, the world that we're coming from. But absolutely, um, in terms of you know established academic names, it's the only uh, version of this which I've seen got is trying to go beyond that. Yeah, which which leads me to my own incredulity because yeah. I've looked looked at this topic, you know, since I you know first got into this and was looking at Jeffrey and and the Brutusilio, and. I've seen a number of arguments uh, of people trying to argue that Jeff, you know, Jeffrey just made it up and that Cilio is an abridgment. And I've not seen one reference of this essay. No. You know, this is an essay by Britain's leading <laughs> archaeologist uh, for, for a long time, for a long period. He was one of Britain's leading archaeologists. Yes. Um, not just in Egypt, but he did loads of work in Britain as well. And... Yeah. The fact that this isn't even I haven't even someone heard someone mention it to discredit it. No. It's it's just not mentioned at all, which is no. unbelievable, really. I yeah, I did try and look in to see if I could find any anyone refuting or arguing against it, couldn't find anything online. Um so it, it's, yeah, it's, it's it's as neglected and ignored as British history is and the brutes history is. Yeah. You know, this is uh, as as ignored, it seems. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it changes everything. Um, so, yeah, we are talking about a a Breton manuscript um, which has a colophon on it, um, attributed to Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, who um, asked Geoffrey of Monmouth to translate and write out. 
Yeah. Um, and 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 Petrie says here that the evidence is in front of us. We we have this document. We have the the proof. It came from an earlier source. Yeah. The next thing Petrie goes into here is that he decides to compare side by side the uh, Julius Caesar's invasions between um, uh, Bello Gallico by Julius Caesar, yeah, Brutus Ilio, Geoffrey. And see if there's anything else in Gildas or Nennius that could be where it can come from, or from other Roman sources as well that he looks at as well. Yeah. Um, basically, see what the information is, where Jeffrey could have got it from, um, and 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 basically what conclusions he can draw from that. Yeah, excellent. And and one one thing before we move on with that, just on this on this last page before the par- paragraph uh, break. Um, Petrie um, says it's a comment on the Celtic mind and how mm. and how um, the the Welsh and the Irish he says um, choose to remember their history and and he said he he says that the the, the Celts prefer literature over history uh, unfortunately um, that that you can take as you know um, that in the west of britain and in ireland there are there is a a, a way to remember history which differs from the, Absolutely, yeah. the established um english mind which is why um london centric academia has has had trouble accepting jeffrey because of its um as 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 uh petrie puts it flowery nature and flowery words of uh mm. the the um you know we've spoken about this before but it's um that is a a what I understand as a as a bit of a cultural and psychological misunderstanding of and absolutely a, yeah, and which leads to a mishandling of of the documents, uh, which sometimes is unfortunately um, fueled by political for political reasons. Yeah, yeah, sometimes uh, quite often. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Let's not get into that on this. Let, one. We've, got that. That. We're not, We've got we have to do it today. <laughs> Exactly. Is <laughs> we don't have to get into it. We're just reading the document. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, he lists the other um, Latin sources that he um, uh, might dip into. Um, Livy, uh, Dion Cassius. Um, all these people have uh, have some some data about Julius Caesar's invasion that isn't in Bello Gallico. Yeah. Um, so he uses those as well. Yeah. Um, and as he, you know, as he says, without the Caesarian bias, bias, because this is one thing. Bello Gallico is Julius Caesar in his own words, isn't it? Uh, and he's obviously not going to say too much that makes himself not sound very good. Um, it's seeing as he uh, his 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 um, streak of good fortune came to a bit of an end when he tried to uh, <laughs> land in Britain. Yeah, so Caesar's first landing was a bit of a mess. Yeah. Um, he had really bad weather. Um, the I think a few of his boats were wrecked, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, he had real problems disembarking. And um, there were even some Britons there to meet him, which made it a whole lot harder as well. Yeah. Um, uh, and Caesar really waxes lyrical about it you know saying oh this is terrible and the and the weather was against me and there was and there were people there to meet us and it was really difficult and none of this is in jeffrey or tassilio and if anything it it does you know it it would look pretty good for the britons to be in there it's it's a you know they were not only there and ready and waiting for him but um he had a rough time of it. It's a good way to embarrass him, all this sort of stuff, and it's just not mentioned at all. So uh, this is one of the things that reoccurs through this this part of the argument is that um, um, there's plenty in Caesar that would have been really great uh, ammunition for, Jer- uh, for Jeffrey, basically. Yeah. Really yeah. good stuff to show how the Britons were, were, were great and, um, and that Caesar was was crap basically <laughs> and it's it's just not in Tassilio at all or or Jeffrey um no. and he um I think we will get to there but I think it's worth stating now is that Petrie comes to the conclusion that Jeffrey did not use Bello Gallico at all mm. which, um, which yeah yeah 
it, considering it is the only document we have today, uh, apparently, yeah. if we don't count Jeffrey mm -hmm. or Brutusilio, um, mm -hmm. you know, save for these small mentions in Dion Cassius and things like that, that means Jeffrey had something that is, you know, important. Yes, um, yes. Uh, he also makes the statement, uh, you know, that, that possibly that these... Um, um, the Britons that were there to meet him were like a small local force that seen yeah. something was going on and isn't necessarily represented by the leaders of Britain, especially the leaders of the area where he believes Tassilio was probably written as well. Um, because he feels like they should have had those details if, if, if that was the case. Yeah, so he, he goes in and he, he does several events, doesn't he, from, from Caesar's Evasion where yeah. he shows that they were either, as I've said before, either really good places for where, you know, the Britons could have used this in their history as something to their advantage, but they don't for some reason. Yeah. So including, there's also some places where the, the uh, Tassilio and Geoffrey is more embarrassing for the Britons than it is for Caesar. And yet, nevertheless, it is in that. And considering that one thing that's levelled against Jeffrey repeatedly is that this is propaganda in all but order to make the Britons seem better. And yet, straight from this early example, it just does not do that compared to compared to the Latin sources. Exactly, exactly that. So he, if if he was looking to do that, he would have been been able to look into. Um those yeah. uh over documents and and uh you know absolutely or just his advantage so but if so he, it, 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 sorry go ahead no i was just going to say he's it's leveled that he's fabricated the whole thing from the yeah. beginning anyway so why write why write anything that's that's bad on the Britons? i mean it, yeah it's nuts but as you say yeah he could look back at those latin documents if they were available to him at the time yeah um although i think the first the first copy of Bella Calico wasn't really copied out until the the twelfth century or thirteenth century even. Right. So, um, from a German monastery, I believe. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. That's in, that's good to know. That's good to know. Mm. Um, but but nevertheless, I think it, it does show that he is translating from a source rather than inventing it. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, right. Brutus, Brutus. So the the yeah uh, one of the um, really interesting things which which Petrie argues is the way in which um, some of the locations um, across the Mediterranean basin um, are noted and and which order they're noted in. Um, Petrie argues that firstly they he uses names um, which no one past seven hundred AD would use. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, to to describe some of the um, the 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 goalposts along the way and mm. explains I think where does he go into it so um, the the Salinai uh, which is a, a stretch of salt lagoon is a place where you stop to get salt fish you know mm -hmm. it makes sense to stop off at these places but you wouldn't call it that any our past seven hundred AD due to um, Arab uh, conquests as uh, renaming certain places, so it's it's uh, this this is an interesting element because mm. okay, sure you can you can retain those, that information and those names, um, but it seems to be the nature in which they're retained is along with this brute chronicle, which is talking about a whole migration from this area. Here's the welcome back. Um, it's a slight technical difficulty, but now we're back. <laughs> <laughs> we're back on. Cool. So yeah, I think so. Yeah. Aside from uh, the the um, the presence of these older names for certain parts of the Mediterranean Sea and the voyage um, of Brutus uh, being in there, um, we we've got this the the presence of the Brutus narrative in Nennius as well, uh, saying about how Geoffrey of Monmouth often gets accused of inventing the Trojan um, narrative or the Brutus, Brutus narrative. 
um, yet it appears in Nennius, which is ninth century. Um, mm. He was he was writing in uh, around eight fifty, um, which the, the the date given for the brute to Cilio is isn't much. It's not much before this, but one hundred and fifty years before that. So. Yeah. To imagine that the Brutus Cilio is actually as old as they that is claimed, I don't think is um, is is outrageous, and it just so happens to be the um, the beginning of writing in that way uh, for the Welsh. Mm-hmm. Because we're, we're talking about a culture who are very heavily in the oral, oral tradition, as opposed to writing down. Um, Absolutely, I think. Uh... Caleb Howells makes an interesting point about Nennius is that he actually gives us information about Brutus that that Geoffrey doesn't. Um, um, For instance, naming him as or locating him as the the first consul of Rome. Um, Ah, right. Yes. You know, he's very specific about who Brutus was in Nennius. Um, But yeah, but but as you say, yeah, Geoffrey gets accused of of inventing the whole thing whereas Nennius not only gives us the whole story but even even dates it by telling us who who Brutus is uh, yeah. which is yeah. very interesting so Brutus um being uh yeah the, the first consul of what's his name not, Lu- not Lucius Lucius Junius Lucius, Lucius Junius. Junius. Brutus. yeah not not the other one who assassinated Julius Caesar but yes uh, who has yeah. a very similar name to Lucius Junius Brutus. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And also had um, Phrygians fighting from, or Brigis fighting from as well. So that, I was looking into that. I thought uh, it's an oh, interesting yeah. interesting crossover there, um, but seemingly unrelated. Um, but um, so what um, I think one of the conclusions Petrie comes to is that the Trojan thing, the Trojan narrative, um, must have come from uh, someone who lived in Rome, uh, a Welsh monk or a Welsh person living in Rome, who wanted to equate himself with the origin narrative of the Romans, which is why um, he used the theme of the Aeneid to do that. Um, now that that throws up some uh, that throws up questions for us when. We talk about um, obviously if the if the Romans come from the Trojans and the Welsh come from the Trojans, they must be kin in some. That thing with with talking speech, haven't we? With the with the, yeah, he identifies as a similar similarity in language. Um, so I think you know Petrie might have been saying that 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 um, might have been done in order to. It was used to to be the the or, origin narrative of Rome. Mm-hmm. So so to to graft the Welsh onto there, why would someone want to do that? Is the question, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the big question, which I don't think is taken very seriously at all. And and also, when would you want to do that? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. because yeah. because, uh, yeah. because it, it could seem. It would seem to me that if it is fictional, yeah, you know, and, and grafted on, then that would make sense as something to do in the first or second or third century AD. Yeah, but going past that, it doesn't really seem like a very. It it becomes an increasingly less relevant thing to do. Absolutely. So is it. In in if we're talking about uh, make doing that in the first century, which is when Petrie is suggesting, mm-hmm. it, it's what what I'm reminded of is the the, the house arrest of Caradoc and this mm. whole the, the the whole epic and episode of um, the how the, the, his house arrest by Claudius. Um, there's all sorts of questions you can ask aside from that. You know, saying things like, did they speak a similar language? You know. If, if it wasn't a similar language, similar language, you know, uh, we're talking about a culture which was educated enough to have to Latin, you know, Latin speakers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, all all of this, all of these questions start start to arise. And you know, who exactly did the Romans feel like they were meeting, and who did the Welsh feel they were meeting on this, um, it, it, on Claudian on the Claudian invasion of Britain. 
because um, mm -hmm. it, it it's possible if 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 you can attribute truth to the the Brutus narrative, um, then we're talking. They're talking about kin who are five hundred. They've been separated for five hundred years. They, mm -hmm. They're, they're going to recognise each other. Uh, the long lost brothers. Absolutely, especially uh, when the the, the 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 thinkers get involved. You know, yeah, I mean, exactly. might not be it might not be uh, immediately. Uh, you know, uh, immediately obvious to to two men meeting on a battlefield, but as soon as there's an exchange of ideas, yeah. these things will become pretty clear pretty quickly, I imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. I've just just seen this bit um, under the paragraph break on notes to Cilio, Nennius, and Gildas. Yeah. Um, you mentioned briefly this this confusion between uh, was it Duro Vellum and uh, Duro. Um, yeah, yeah, Durabellus, Durabellus, yeah, and yeah. basically saying that th this, um, this mistake is evident in Nennius, and so it means that Nennius must have been following to mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, rather than rather than Caesar, and also as and he says here, Caesar is never named as one of Nennius's authorities, so. Oh. Nennius had some sort of uh, was following some sort of set of documents, and and the Tacilio and Nennius both are, are similar in as much as they they're like compilations, aren't they? They yeah. they they they've selected bits from the, they probably didn't have one document that they were just adding to over time. Mm. Uh, at some point, Tacilio and Nennius drew from lots of different sources, and this is evident in Nennius anyway because he gives. Um, he doesn't just give the Brutus story as as a founding myth of Britain, does he? He gives, I believe, he gives two or possibly three founding myths of Britain. Mm. Um, the one that I remember, other than the Brutus story, is one that was very traditional in medieval Europe, which is to do with um, descendants from from Noah. Yeah, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, uh, and true. the Old Testament patriarchs, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we get that yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I will. I think we should do some stuff on Nennius. That'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, I'd love to go uh, Nennius. Yeah. Another another interesting element of the Tassilio, however, is also the the uh, the idea of the of British Jerusalem as well, and uh, mm -hmm. and we get um, some very interesting. Uh, um, sort of mentions in the Tissue about uh, Jerusalem being built in South Wales or Carisalem. So mm. you you get that you get that narrative coming in the, in the British Tissue as well, which is another uh, a very important part of the when you're talking about origin narratives in Britain. It's definitely it's in the Tissue. So it's it's a it's a, that's where it, that's that's the the length the length of of that narrative in in Britain at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, and 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 Jesus in Britain and everything like that. It's very Absolutely. old. Yeah, uh, and I think he's going to go into Christianity in in this bit as well, isn't he, Petrie? Yeah. Petrie yeah. deals with early Christianity as well in this in this in this essay. I think one of the yes. um, interest there's an interesting point to make here about um, the year that Christianity first came into Britain. Yeah, we have from from Gildas we have. Uh, was it the, was it the last year of Tiberius? Is it or Tiberius? The, uh, yeah, Tiberius. And last there are people, Tiberius. people, people who would argue that there's a confusion with because some people say this is Joseph of Arimathea coming in. Yeah, and we're looking at about 30, 38, Is it thirty eight AD? The last so, year? yeah, thirty eight, yeah, yeah thirty seven, thirty eight, yeah. And one people, one argument that people used to against this is that Tiberius was also a name used by Claudius. Ah, ah. Um, however, that also still puts it to around <laughs> between fifty-five and sixty yeah. AD. Yeah, exactly. Which is yeah. exactly when Bran was meant to bring Christianity yeah. back from Rome. <laughs> so from Rome. on the one yeah. hand, on the on the one hand we have Joseph of Arimathea. On the other hand, we have Bran bringing Christianity back from Rome. Both of which are are generally sniffed at and sneered at. Yeah, 
but we have our, our earliest British source, if you don't count the Tassilio, mm. is Gildas, and he is saying as clear as day that it's got to be one of those dates. <laughs> you know, it's got to yeah. be. You know, he he is either re- he's referring to one of those events. Um, he's unfortunately he's not as clear. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II certainly thought it was the first event of Joseph of Arimathea. Um, yeah. Wilson and Blackett list several. So you know they they talk about how you can push it back early. Um, you know you can look at Lyrig, Lucius. You can look at yes. Brian and Caradoc, or you can look at Joseph of Arimathea, and and frankly, none of them um, contradict each other either. No, no, exactly. No, exactly. Quite neatly uh, work together, actually. Like Absolutely. you said, Brian. Jo- jo- yeah, jo- Joseph of Arimathea purely could have. Um, created a small Christian community which didn't have a much of a wider effect on Britain for all we know mm, and yeah. and it was only the you know the, the British royals coming back that really you know expediated the the, the shift towards Christianity but it, yeah. these are all ifs buts and maybes that we can we can talk about but I think it's quite clear that Christianity came to Britain in the first century AD and not late not later than that absolutely yeah um and we've got evidence from that you know in the in the video we did on on british christianity we've got we've got um other tra- traditions of other countries remembering um apostles coming to britain um and we've also got uh, evidence of tower crosses which can be um uh, dated as you know first and second century so um Whichever way you spin it, we can't say that um, <laughs> Christianity <laughs> didn't come here with Saint Augustine. <laughs> and yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> God. You know, yes, yeah. that's clear at least. <laughs> that and, and Petrie goes on on here to um, talk about the Council of Arles, which I um, uh, mentioned before, saying that British bishops were attending in three one four, and I think that's one of the first councils. It's, bef- it's before the Council of Nicaea. It's about ten mm-hmm. years before, which is the big, the first big one, which established established the uh, the creed of Catholicism. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're they're on they're attending councils as as respected uh, equals at that point. Absolutely, especially in Arles. I mean, Arles is is it's not really far from con- considering where where these events could take place in the Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah. Arles is not really very far away from Britain. And there's plenty of evidence of um, churchmen in in France mixing, uh, traveling to Britain, such as Germanus of Auxerre. Um, this was something that was happening throughout yeah. throughout this period. So, I think I might have mentioned this before on an earlier one, but um, King Lyric, Lucius, Lucius, yeah. Um, obviously, there are churches in South Wales uh, dedicated to Fagan and is it Fagan? Yes, yeah. Fagan of Dovran. Yes, Dovran. Um, and we know that, as we say, the British churches are named after their founders, so we can assume these church sites go back to the second century. Mm. Um, also, it's interesting. Um, there isn't a Lan Lyric church, but there is a Lan Irig church where the L's been dropped. Happens. And um, a while back, when I, when I first looked into this, it was it was so fascinating because on their little church website, there's the story of the of, you know of the name of the church, and they say there's no records of a Saint Irig. Yeah. Um, but all we the story is that he was a king who sent to Rome to be Christianized and two saints came over and baptized him in the local river. <laughs> but we have no <laughs> idea who this person was. <laughs> you think, well, mm. let me just send you a copy of Tassilio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly who he was. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's quite mad that, you know what, you have this stuff on one side and in the, in the text and they're saying, ah, oh, this is, you know, this is a fiction. It's a mis- the letters from someone else. Um, uh, and then you go to the churches and they go, oh, well, we've got this story, which is exactly the same story, but we don't know who it's about or who these people mm. are. And you just think, wow, if you, you know, just draw these things together and you've, you've got not only 
your textual evidence, but your your place name physical evidence as well. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. That is. Um, you only think that if if possibly if uh, if uh, Petrie's dot essay had been a bit more successful, we might be a bit more aware of these links. Um, mm, mm. Yeah, in, 100%. The, in the general discourse, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I, 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 I don't understand why it hasn't been. Um, I, I mean, even in in our world, uh, you know, it's taken me. It took me until I was writing my dissertation to even come across it. You know, I, I never heard of it before. I mean, I hadn't read the Holy Kingdom at that point. I probably would have heard of it then. <clears throat> so you know, but. Yeah, I've I've not heard of I've not heard of uh, Pete, Petrie do this. At no, all. no. no. Yeah. Oh, this this is a good bit here, Adam. Yeah. Uh, I'll, just is quoting. Is is not this the case of British history surviving at Rome, as in the work of Pontif uh, Ponticus Verinius, who quotes writings of Gildas, which are now lost. Ah, yes. Yeah, we've we've talked about Verinius, haven't we, in our in our own time. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So um, this, uh, thanks to Old Boy for this, um, who, who uploaded a video talking about uh, the, this topic um, and how um, John Milton, uh, when he wrote his uh, English, History of England, cited um, Virinius, uh, who, who cited the... Or, or, Explain the the Brutus history and the Brutus migration to Britain uh, in the first century as an original Greek source, which was translated by Gildas. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so, we don't we, but we that's not in the documents of Gildas that we or the document of Gildas that we have. No, no, absolutely. You know, we we didn't even know that Gildas did more than um, the just the, the the ruin of Britain. You know, it's. Yeah. So there's 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 more works from Gildas out there and translations which aren't collected. But um, so it'd be need... really good if we can get hold of Verinius. It'd be really really helpful if we get hold of that. Yeah. 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 Uh, because and... that would yeah that would be yeah I mean so um, I'm is I'm not sure if Petrie is saying here that that's where the source of the brutes history is. No, think? I think what he's what he's saying here is that um, he thinks that uh, Roman writers writing later are drawing from drawing from the Tassilio, yeah, about certain events rather than rather than their own local. Doc Let's just um, scroll down. Yeah, a little bit. So I think it's to do with um, confusion of names. With yeah. with okay. Marcus Antonio Varela, so there, there's there's some sort of, um, yeah, it's it's here. So, uh, Bede gives the legal names and not the popular names. Proves that he's quoting from an official document and knew more than his editor. Can it be supposed that Platina, about fourteen seventy six, drew from Je drew from Tassilio or Geoffrey? Mm. These details to simplify the Liber Pontificalis. Is it not the case? So he's he's basically saying that there seems to be an uh, an interchange of of Latin and Britain doc, British documents, and yes. that's his point point about Verinius and about how names are made, and uh, and how that there must be earlier British documents yeah. coming yeah. out of Britain and being shared, you know, mm. in Rome. I think it was really interesting as well what you said about. Um, Verinius getting his uh, sorry, Gildas copying from a Greek source. Yeah, because earlier for people who've paused and and read it through, you will see that Petrie points to one of the spelling errors. Probably comes from where a Greek letter has been yeah. misused. So again, we have the fact that there is some sort of writing in Greek going on about the events of uh, first century events of. Um, well, God, Julius Caesar is not even the first, first century BC, isn't it? Julius Caesar, mm. yeah, um, yeah. Or BC. and it's um, he reckons it was probably written down in the first century, though. But it's interesting, Greek is being used because even if even if there was a 
how should we say a uh, a connection between Latin and and Brythonic. Yeah. Still, even at that time, the Latins go to language. You know, in fact, Europe's go to language for a for a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Lingua franca. Yeah, lingua franca for is it's Greek. Greek. Well, it's Greek. Greek yeah, at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they used Greek. They didn't use yeah. Latin. Greek right. was the lingua franca. I mean, so so yeah, Latin was their their official language that they did everything in. But if you were to if you were to go to travel to Egypt or travel to you know the Middle East or whatever, you you'd speak Greek. And there were Greek colonies yeah. all over, you know, Spain, southern France. So, and although obviously Italy, uh, sorry, Rome itself grew in in power and strength and and cultural power. Really, the Greeks were the the cultural leaders at the time, mm. and yeah, so it, it makes total sense that if there were people recording things here in Britain, the Greek is a Greek would be a language to be used. Okay. So that's interesting that that's come up twice in this essay, yes. or from this essay anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, in all the period that we have been noting, there is nothing more than a florid expansion of Tassilio except in a few fresh pages, mainly from Nennius and Gildas. So everything in Geoffrey can be found in Tassilio, except for a few, in the period in question, the Roman period in question, mm. everything can be found in Tassilio, except for a few scraps, which are in Nennius and Gildas. So he, although he def definitely used Nennius and Gildas, he did not use any Latin sources. And then he, he, this is interesting. It's about the the prophecies of Merlin and yeah. the um, Arthur's European campaign. Oh, now, yeah. um, the, these are bits. These are the prophecies of Merlin is is clearly an interpolation. In fact, I think um, Jeffrey says I intended to publish this in another book, mm. um, and then he goes, "Oh well, but I put it in here instead, or or, or something like that." Um, and these are these are two sections which are again used to 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 sort of criticize Jeffrey and talk about him as a you know it's it's and how the the, the book is in itself is not um, doesn't flow properly because it's got these interruptions and it's got this mythical magical element, but it's clear the prophecies are a a political statement. Yeah. They are their way of encoding historical information and a uh, a political message going forward. Yeah. Um, and Magnus Maximus's campaign, or, or should we say, Arthur's European campaign, is clearly like he had this this a separate document that covered the campaign. Mm. Um, at some point, there's become this confusion between Andragathius's, um, uh, the name Andragathius and Arthur, and he genuinely believed he had another piece of Arthur's story, mm. so he sort of bunged it in where he thought it should go. Um, Petrie doesn't. Yeah. Petrie doesn't note in this that it's that it's clearly Magnus Maximus's campaign, but several people have since, not just Wilson and Blackett as well. Um, you know, quite a few scholars, you know, academics and things have, have noticed that this is the same story. Um, but I think what's interesting is that it shows that there was a version in Britain that talked about Andragathius leading, leading the campaign, not Magnus Maximus. Yes, Does that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. The detail, yeah. Because that's where the confusion with Arthur comes. We have yeah. this An yeah. Anthon or Anthon or or whatever he might have been recorded in a, in a Welsh version, mm. and he's gone. Oh, oh, bugger! <laughs> you know, where am I going <laughs> to stick this in? Oh, I'll, I'll put it in. It just sort of feels right here, you know. And I'll continue mm. using some of the characters and things like that. Although there could be some other confusion with names going on there. But yeah. I think Petrie's point is that Jeffrey clearly says. These are interpolations. And then after the European campaign, he goes, now back to my Welsh book. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and Pet Petrie's just saying, like, he says it there. We don't need to, we don't need to get like uppity about where these things came from or anything like that. He says it's an interpolation. We don't have to worry about it interrupting 
Pathilio's narrative. No. Um, because Jeffrey is quite clear about what is what is separate from the from the Tassilio text. Nice. So I think I think that's really important. We'll leave a link to this for anyone who wants to read it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's brilliant, and everyone should have a look through it. Yeah, it doesn't take that long. He notes one specific event where it differs from Julius Caesar's account. It does not show the Britons in a particularly good light. And it's confirmed in another Latin document. Yeah. I, I believe can't... it's in Dion Cassius. I can't remember what the right. event is. I think it's to do with um, uh, the siege. Um, there's a siege at the, towards the end where uh, Julius Caesar was quite successful. Right. I, yeah. I don't. I don't even. I don't. It might not even be in Julius Caesar either. So, but basically, the point is, is that we have have an event, which is is um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's confirmed by another piece of history. Yeah. But another piece of history that we do not believe that Jeffrey drew from. You know that the, the, there isn't any evidence that he drew from, and it doesn't show the Britons in a very good light. So it, it just it's it's a really interesting point that there is there is confirmable history in Jeffrey, yes, that isn't isn't propaganda and doesn't come directly from Ballo Gallico or another document. Um, um, and I'm sorry if I'm misquoting yeah. Jeffrey then, but it, you, if you find the section, it's quite clear the point he's making. Um, yeah. Again, doesn't fit in with this idea of making up a uh, self-aggrandizing narrative. No, absolutely oh, not. Okay. Cool. Which is pretty much essentially um, what Jeffrey's contemporaries accused him of. Yes, and people later, not just not just his contemporaries, but right up till this day, people accuse him of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's like it's like we're hundred years behind. <laughs> yeah, because I <laughs> yeah, I know this 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 <laughs> this essay should have really just stopped all that, shouldn't it? I mean, well, yeah. fair enough. It's fair enough. Things are always up for debate. That's fine, but well, there absolutely. is. It, the, I think this this essay is is brilliant for just sort of making brilliant ar arguments against these things and and drawing it directly from the, the data from the texts as well. Mythical matter and also much that seems least certain in Tercilio is distinctly borrowed by Geoffrey, as romance introduced by request, but not drawn from his ancient sources. Yeah. Thus, Geoffrey is fully justified when he begins by stating Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, offered me a very ancient book in the British tongue, which related to the actions of all British kings and ending that he advised other writers to be silent concerning the kings of the Britons, since they have not took, uh, they have not that book written in the British tongue, which Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, brought out of Brittany. For the end of the Welsh Tercilio is a is the colophon. I, Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, translated this book from the Welsh into Latin, and in my old age have again translated it from the Latin into Welsh. That such a work did exist long before Walter is guaranteed by the brute Brynhenneth, written in Brittany, in the Breton dialect in the time of Athelstan. 925941 by an insular Briton. All the main points of the story, bringing over from bringing over Maximus from Rome, down to the fable of the 11,000 virgins, all these are to be found in the Brute Brynhenneth. I would say as well that uh, one thing I've thought of in the past is that even if Walter didn't have his original Welsh copy, he's going to assume that Geoffrey did a blinding job translating it into Latin. Yeah. So if there is any evidence that in um, Walter's Brute Cilio that there's stuff from Geoffrey that doesn't come from anywhere else, it's probably because he used Geoffrey's copy in order to translate it back. Yeah. Because yeah. he's not gonna he's not gonna assume that Geoffrey's fictionalized anything or created anything. He's just gonna say, well this is the document. I'm just yeah, just translating. He probably used it as an aid for translation. Yeah. So, 
I, I, I don't see. I, I never found that sticking point uh, personally. No. Uh, and the, also the fact that you know, <laughs> I just think this is brilliant that you've got Jeffrey saying, "Oh, I, you know, I, I got this book from Walter," and everyone goes, "Nah, he just made that up." And now we've got a, and we've also got a document <laughs> that has in Walter's own writing. I brought this book over. Yeah, I yeah, literally. It, you know, yeah. I mean, what more do you want, really? It's... What, yeah. What more do you want? It's yeah. It, it, he's he's clearly vindicated for me. You know. Yeah. It, it, it's um, it, he's he's working from a document which is we've got evidence for. As Petrie says, we've clearly got the evidence in front of us. Yeah. There's a, there's, there's a little bit. I, I mean, but my takeaway from it was is that I get kind of annoyed when I see the the idea of the Saxon the Saxon invasion, it's it's either presented to us as a, as it was a bloody slaughter where Saxons yeah. came Saxons were invited in by Vortigern and then they slaughtered their way east to west, um clearing the lands and pushing the Britons back into um Back into it, back it, back into into the west, yeah. into Wales, into right. Cornwall, you know, into into Strathclyde or whatever. Yeah, and 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 you know, Gildas is used as 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 evidence for this, despite the fact that Gildas is clearly writing a a religious, you know, religious invective. You know, he's not he's not trying to do an accurate history. Yeah. Um. And now modern evidence is showing there's a lot more mixing. There was cultural spread. Yeah. You know, as we've said many times, there's plenty of Brythonic DNA in the in the traditionally Saxon areas. And what we're now presented with is the argument was, well, either it was a bloody slaughter or it was just peaceful cultural <laughs> spread. No in as between. It, yeah. No in between. No no possibility that anything that there's grey areas in between that we could have had um, periods of peaceful spread interspersed mm. with pretty nasty battles and maybe even some rather unpleasant genocide even um, mm. is distinctly possible as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing Petrie does quite well is show that in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle um the battles seem to be quite well spread as if there were no sort of sections, you know, no air, no times of peace. Like for instance, he's talking about Arthur's, uh, Arthur's 20 years of peace, you know, when, when does this, when does this happen? Cause there seems to be battles spread out, but then he shows how the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a lot of the events happen on special Easter calendar mm. years. Mm. Yeah. And that what's probably happened is that someone has spread certain events over a number of years to make the document basically look better and read better um and it's yeah. chosen certain years for their religious significance yes yeah. uh, you know as how, rather than how how they probably appeared in the original annals would have been which would have been clumps of events as things happen and that makes sense i mean if you think about any war now you have you have there's a periods of extreme violence yeah and calm periods extreme violence calm periods things aren't spread out you know um especially if you know if a brythonic kingdom was being invaded then that that fighting would be happening but that wouldn't but other areas wouldn't be suffering you know uh, i don't know but he does a really good job of showing how one that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, as well, isn't isn't um, God's word, like no, some people no. make it out to be, and that it's yeah. it's just as flawed as other annals from the period, especially for the periods in question that we're talking about, yeah. um, the fifth and sixth sixth century. Um, but also, getting back to my original point, is what Petrie does is. If we want answers about how, in what form the Saxon invasion took, just read Tassilio. Just read Geoffrey of Monmouth. He says how lands were given over to the to the Saxons. He says yeah. how that sometimes the Britons worked together, sometimes that they were 
fighting each other. You know, he, he says it's 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 all quite quite clear. You know, yeah. There, there, yeah. there's no there's no dichotomy that we have to work out between you know genocidal violence and 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 mm. peaceful cultural spread. It's somewhere in between, just as the documents say it is. Yeah, some something which comes to mind is is the the the, the fact that. When I started getting into history in my younger years and looking at the incepting, well, the the sort of formative years of Britain and the peoples of the island, and and we got into the topic of Saxon invasion, um, you, in in modern uh, presentations, you don't even get the the uh, the the kind of presentation that um, they were invited over in, in the beginning by Vortigern, or that's mm. not even discussed. It's kind of um, you get this idea is the Romans left and left a vacuum and the Saxons took advantage. That's, yeah. the, that's the given narrative that you get. And then um, you've had people like uh, Francis Pryor say, no, they came over gently and it was, it was gradual in order. And then, and, it, and then you've had people really re respond and say, no, we've had, we had it as an invasion. Uh, we came here, the, we fought, the Britons fought back. We, mm. we're hit by conquest um so i think this particular um topic especially the anglo-saxon invasion very flavored by politics unfortunately but actually if you look back at the early chronicles it yeah. seems it it, it it affords you that uh much more realistic and human depiction which makes more practical sense um yeah. so we might add uh, corresponds with the latest DNA findings, uh, grave trends, and how. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Burial trends and things like that. Burial, yeah. burial trends. There was 80, 80 graves which were um, assessed, and you found that you had Britons being buried in Saxon contexts and reverse, and also um, intermix, intermixing genetically, uh, and pe people who had more British DNA, tended to have more Christian burials and more people, people had more sex and, you know, but there's, yeah. all, there's all sorts of intermixture going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's and, such and a complex, such a complex period. And I think we are so often just given two very, we're given the most simplistic things and say, I'm told to pick one. Yeah. You, know I mean? you are told to pick one. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, I've seen people, talk about this this particular genetic study um which came up relatively recently um and and it shows that they i mean these people argue that there was an invasion there was an anglo-saxon invasion that did exist and it replaced they claimed a they, they claimed, this is the thing that got me about it they said they said it the, the saxons replaced 80 percent of british dna in what is now england however However, um, that doesn't correspond with what you actually find in the graves because you. you so they're saying that an invasion happened, but an, a, a British invasion of England happened again. That's what they're arguing. I don't think that makes sense to me. Um, it seems but, like a complex answer rather than yes. you know often often yeah. razor or you know yeah yeah yeah. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I'm pretty no. happy to accept that there was conquest. I mean, yeah, let's be real. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of these people who are denying that the Saxons invaded, but um, to which extent we've, we, you know, no. it seems like what, what they found in the gene, the genetic data and the ancient documents do correspond, which is absolutely a little bit of both. And, a little bit of both. Yeah. And that's, sort of down the middle but it's it's sort of based to me yes that seems pretty basic absolutely and it, it, yeah. things like this are, are rarely as simple as one or the other you know no. you can't you can't think of there's no, there's no examples of from from modern history about you know just clear people just storming across and murdering everyone in their wake and yeah. pushing them into a corner that just it just doesn't happen you know um i think it's interesting about what you said about Vortigern's invitation as well. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the uh, it talks about William of Newburgh 
one of Jeffrey's contemporary, or not quite contemporary critics. I think he was a generation. Jeffrey was dead by he was by the time he was writing. Um, the section about Vortigern is um, the only section that he believes is accurate. Really? Yeah. Right. So if if Jeffrey was just fabricating that, <laughs> his yeah. contemporary critics certainly didn't think he was, and you know oh. why? It's because it appears in Bede. Yeah, right. and I... it's very clear. You know, if anyone ever says to you, "Oh well, Jeffrey's contemporary critics didn't like it," ask them if they're talking about William of Newburgh, because mm-hmm. his introduction to his history of England is basically a piece of political invective against Britons. It's very unpleasant, bordering on racist at some points. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And he it basically says, "Oh, if 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 it doesn't appear appear in Bede, it doesn't happen." So those things that appear in Bede, <laughs> Bede largely drew from Gildas, which is quite funny, um, especially for the periods in question. Yeah. But yeah, he 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 confirms the whole event with Watergun. You know, and says, "Oh, yeah, that that's very true." You know that that actually happened, but everything else was nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is really awful. I, I, I'll yeah, send the link right. over so you can put it in the bottom as well for other people oh, to read. Right. Because if people use William of Newburg to be a real piece of historical criticism, then that is not that is not good history because it is it, it, the politics of William of Newburg are quite evident quite evident and as i say bordering on unpleasant at some points um so yeah that's that's interesting that in it now you know if we're talking about how history works and you know we're going to ignore vortigan because it's something from the british legends well no not not always considered just to be so so yeah absolutely considered 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 to be proper history even by critics of jeffrey of monmouth yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can never pronounce his name. Amianus. Yeah, Amianus describes the Saxons and Franks ravaging Britain in three six four and three six eight, and a defeat defeat of the Saxons in three seven four. I think this is interesting because this is when Britain was um, going through a period of of usurper emperors. The, the yeah. emperors, of, emperors of the West, and I think when you look, and the 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 idea I get from looking at the documents with the with the Roman withdrawal, people like to you know talk about the withdrawal of the Romans leaving Britain. It seems clear to me that the British elites were fed up of paying for something that they yes. weren't getting. Yes, they were paying for for Roman soldiers to defend their country. And they weren't getting that defence, and it seems clear from the records that they booted out the Romans because they were not getting what they wanted. I think by that time, I think probably by the end of the fourth century, probably before four ten, you know, this sort of period they're talking about. Yes, the the Roman economy would have collapsed in northern France, mm. so Britain not only would have not have had the the benefit of the the Roman trade. But they wouldn't have had the benefit of the Roman soldiers either, and they were sick of it because mm-hmm. they were constantly getting hounded on the east coast by the, by the Germanic tribes. Looks like the Franks were coming up as well from the south. No wonder the southeast of England was in tatters by four tw- by four ten. No, you know, I think that was well on the way of happening before four ten. I don't think it collapsed overnight. You know, just as soon as the Romans left, I think it was already on that way. And do you know what? I imagine there probably were some Saxon settlements before Vortigern invited yeah. Hengist yeah. and Vorta over, even if they were only, you know, basically pirating strongholds or something like that. It's probably better to invite them at that point rather than let them, you know, absolutely, yeah, yeah, a little bit of involved. land which was boarded off and sectioned to say, well, I'll give you that bit. You can have Kent. So yeah. as you fight, help you fight these these bugs. Uh, these other ones, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah makes sense. And and especially it, yeah. because I, I think these were the elites in Western Britain who, frankly, had their own stuff to deal with in the West. You yeah, know, they, they they didn't have time to deal with the Saxon shore. They had they had Irish to deal with. They had their own business to attend to, essentially. Mm. Um, yeah, and and I, I say that I think they were 
they were sick of dealing with it. So the Romans had to go because they were paying for something that they weren't getting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very different story than than what you're given uh, in the mainstream today, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, it's it's written. I haven't just made that up. You know, it's it's written places that the Romans were asked to leave or rejected. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, triads, exciting. Yeah, absolutely. As the historical historical triads have been quoted here, it may be expected that some notice should be taken of their value for history. Yeah, I should think so too, Peter. Absolutely, damn right, yeah. <laughs> um, that the British mind preferred to group persons and facts in threes as an aid to memory is analogous to the preference of Plutarch for pairs of similar characters or of the Indian mind for groups of four and eight. It has nothing to do with the authenticity of the information thus classified. It obviously is seldom that there is proof of early date of settlement. While it may have been made long after the event, we can, however, certainly put triad 65 of the ports of Britain before AD 450, as it mentions the port of uh, Gwythnau in Cardiganshire as one of the three, or number 37 describes the flooding in the time of Ambrosius of Gwaelod. So that's um, the the lost uh, country, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is a a great uh, triad, isn't it? We'll have to do that at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Which was the domination of Gwydnau, king of Cardigan. Another yeah. dating is of Triad 64, naming the three capitals where Arthur has supreme authority. Uh, St. David being chief bishop, born in 462, and Malgun of North Wales being chief elder. This must have been written before Malgun became king in AD 500. Yes, I prefer later dates for both of these characters anyway, but I think the point remains the same. Yeah. That it's after um, Malgun is king, unlikely they're going to have a triad written in the area mm. saying that he was supplicant to someone else. <laughs> yeah, well, it is quite unlikely, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, these things are uh, constructive retrospectively, aren't they? Yeah. Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, in certain places, uh, like, Diera and Bernicea um, are being referred to as British in, in Triad 7. You know, and obviously they were they were some of the first Angle kingdoms. The whole collection must be before Edward Edward I, as this conquest of Wales has left no trace here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it yeah, it's a great it's a great point, isn't it? Because we're uh, yeah. The um, this 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 makes me think of um, Padianet Bath Mar. I know you've you've um, said to me before about uh, difficulty with that one. Uh, yeah, being one of the ones in the is it Mavurian archaeology or was it just one of Yolo's? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the third series they call them the third series of triads, which yeah, is all yeah. all Yolo's triads. Yeah, right. Um, um, but. I don't have a problem with Yolo's tri- triads. Oh, of course, neither do I. Neither do I. I, I mean, I, I, I think, if if anything, for me, uh, I, for me, the the worst things that Yolo did were probably only as bad as what Jeffrey did. Is that yeah. he 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 took something and he made the which he may have not have quite understood. And made the best of it that he could with the information that he had. Indeed, uh, he had to make copies of a lot of things which people absolutely. weren't going to just just you know hand over to him. This random random and knocking on their door, um, and uh, what 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 else uh, with with Yolo? Um, he, I think, it, it looks like one of the most 
damning accusations that he has is um, forging some poetry, but it might actually be that he was just um, taking on the mantle of a uh, was it Daffith Gwilym? Um, yeah, Daffith Gwilym. Yeah. So it, it's um, it, which is know, something that Welsh bards did since Taliesin is, t- is um, take take on the the persona of a yeah. of a you know. I saw a good um, video by David Gwilym Morris, actually. Oh, yeah. Gwilym Morris. Yeah. Gwilym Morris Baird. Sorry, I got daffed up Gwilym and Gwilym Morris Baird. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, he was saying that it seems like an odd thing in a, in a Christian country to sort of, you know, to 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 raise the dead, you know, or to, to inhabit, you know, let these souls inhabit you like possession or something. But it seems yeah. like something that very much was a big part of bardic tradition yeah. so yeah and uh yeah and, and and people say this and even in the same breath which is remarkable is they'll say oh yes it's very traditional for welsh bards to take on a persona of a previous bard and, and write in their way and then they'll go but yolo forged for yeah. <laughs> poems by <laughs> up villain me like what, what? <laughs> hold on a minute uh yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what's going on but yeah, yeah. i i'm and there's also if if you can get a copy of the uh, the third series of Triads, which isn't easy, easy folks, unfortunately. But if you do, you will also see plenty in there that is not controversial, mm. that that isn't wildly unbelievable or anything. Um, and, and you know, and there's other bits. You can see a fantastic Wikipedia entry on um, on Hugo Darn, and at first it. The first paragraph is about how Yolo invented Hugo Dan, and then the next two paragraphs are all the examples of where Hugo Dan appears throughout oh. the centuries in Welsh yeah. tradition. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> you're like, wow, that is an amazing piece of double think. That is, <laughs> it's quite Welsh to... double think, and yeah, it's yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You see it quite a lot, don't you? It's quite concerning Co- cognitive dissonance. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Right. Cool. Right. This was interesting. Um, talking about the laws. Um, and I think he was going, he, Petrie was suggesting that some of the laws in Britain uh, have a pre Christian nature, um, which were preserved in um, the laws of Dunval Mormud. Yeah. Uh, it's an old dating Dunval Mormud is, is difficult. Um, and right. I think that's something we're going to have to look at at some point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I I think Wilson and Blackett certainly put him <clears> in the fourth <throat> century, but pr- traditionally, Jeffrey puts him puts him pre-Roman. Right. Um, I believe um Adrian Gilbert in his latest video referred to him as as pre-Roman as well. Hmm. Um. So yeah, so if anyone ever tells you that Wilson and Blackett just do things you want to hear, <laughs> they don't because because no. you know a lot of people think of Dunval Mormud as a, a pre-Christian king, but I I think in Artorius Rex discovered that they deal with it or uh, they, they refer to it as anyway as a um uh they they do refer to it, but it's something I'm definitely before I say anything for certain I'm gonna I need to look into it myself, so I I could be wrong on that, but um uh. It's something we're going to have to have a look at, but yeah, the the the, the Malmutian laws are fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. I really want to dive into that at some point. Mm. Do that. Yeah. Um, but according to Petrie, uh, he goes into it and says that the the condition of pagan Britain is remarkably preserved in the laws of Dinval Mohammed. Uh, that these laws are currently long before the tenth century is proved by the gulf that exists between the state of society shown by them that the laws of hell fixed that's how the hell uh, yeah yeah um fixed to uh 914 the laws of hell show a highly complex and detailed condition of law and an elaborate royal court with the rights of officials minutely fixed mm-hmm. in the laws of moment there there is very simple law always subject to proof customs and adaptation to circumstance it's interesting um there is no royal court and 
and very few officials with no divine claims. Moreover, the laws of Hawa refer back to Mohammed. What takes the laws of Mohammed uh, to, to at least Roman times is that they are purely pagan and the only Christian allusion is an addition to the forms of legal oath saying that I, in subsequent times, the form of oath has, was given by the Ten Commandments to the just, uh, Gospel of St. John and the breath Blessed Cross. This stamps previous oaths and the rest of the laws of pagan of the pagan period, and therefore at least third century, as British British bishops attended the Council of Ireland three one four. How much farther back these laws may date towards the traditional time of Monmouth, Monmouth in the fourth, fourth or seventh century BC, we cannot now inquire. Hmm. Probably there were a gradual accretion, um, but apparently no part comes under the influence of Christian usage. We can then at least accept the p picture of society here shown that being that the that of the Britons under the earlier part of the Roman domination of two of the two legal series of the triads. Uh, the first short series, 1 to 34, here marked A1. The long series is simply numbered 1, 2, 4, 8. Skeen agrees um, to the laws of Howell being the tenth, being of the 10th century, but never mentions those moulded. Mm. <clears throat> Stephen asserts that the laws of Mulmud were certainly not composed earlier than the six, 16th century. Were what writer of that date would forge a consistent body of primitive tribal law entirely pagan in character and why anyone would sh uh, should do so when the laws of how were celebrated and prized are questioned uh, our question is ignored by the easy assertion of the date uh, of the a late date for which no reason is given brilliant bit of logic yeah it is it, it yeah, absolutely is Absolutely. Yeah. Is. I mean, this is an attack, you know, we're, we're constantly told that, um, uh, you know, the stories of Joseph of Arimathea um, are, uh, etc., are, what do they call them, Ho holy holy fakes or something like that? Yeah. There's, a, there's like a word for it, so it's something like that, holy fakes, let's go with. Now, if you were going to be writing about this very early period of Britain and, and forging something, especially during the late medieval period, you would make it a holy fake. You would yeah. you fill it full of Christian law. That is just so characterful of the time. Um, so yeah, I think I think I think that's a brilliant piece of logic that Petrie's put forward there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, great. Um, I, he goes on uh, a little while after to talk about um, Welsh society, uh, how it remembered in how on the laws of how the of course, to, yeah. To, to accept people in, you know, travellers in and and um, on on their way, give them everything that they need uh, for their journey. Um, sort of quite egalitarian, quite you know, a lot of equality for for women as well. Um, you know, all of these hallmarks of a society which, you know, <laughs> is is said to be barbaric a lot of the time. Yes, yeah. You know, in comparison to what the Romans were like, at the you know, compared to the Britons, you know, in the. Uh, I think even I mean, yeah. uh, with the time of Haldar as well. I think even compared to the Saxons, I think this was quite progressive. Um, yeah, absolutely. Especially, you know, especially as you say, in terms of women, um, yeah. uh, Saxons and women didn't have a great place in in Saxon society. Um, and I'm not saying they had an amazing place in British society, but it, mm. it certainly seems like it was it was more egalitarian, as you say. Yeah. Um, I've also read a really interesting section about slavery as well. Ah, um, right. Yeah, and, and slavery was no doubt a, a big thing for a long time on the British Isles. Um, yeah. uh, especially the Irish Sea was known as a real slaver's sea. Mm. Um, um, between Wales and Cornwall and Ireland, obviously, um, but there seem the, the the argument I was basically reading is that all these people are slavers, but leaning towards the end of the 
the I was about to say the last millennium, but the end of the last millennium was only thirty years ago. Uh, the, the the millennium before that, you know, the time yeah. of Haldar, the tenth tenth century, Saxons were much bigger slavers than the Britons were. Right. Um, uh, yeah, considerably so, especially because a lot of their slaves uh, were Britons as well. Mm. Um, which is is yeah. is the idea of why Welsh uh, means can mean slave. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in there as well. Yeah. So just have a look, quick look at the Mulwiki laws, which um, are in this in this document. We can see a few tribes that are cited by Petrie, um, which give give us a, a little feel of um, what's going on. So the the tribal bond is broken up by famine, earthquake, or flood, or conquest, and the tribe must be given a new form or social state. Interesting, um, interesting law there. Because mm. um, uh, going back to what we we're saying uh, in the last uh, video about um, identity uh, and uh, the possibil possibility of um, the in within the church, the Israelite identity, and how that might have shifted, and what's happened in history since, and you know we've got a law here saying that. Um, a new identity or a new state must be instantiated upon, um, you know, natural disaster or you know cultural disaster. Um, mm. So that, that could add add in why potentially those sorts of ideas might have been forgotten by some, uh, much to the uh, dismay of Gildas, who was writing then. Um, in more personal matters, no arms might be shown in a convention or the country and lord or, or convention of independence or convention of the bards so you you can't just brandish your sword around at an event you know you can't just this is about um showing respect this is a, a kind of um to to be to be humble in these uh and and what makes me think of the um night of the long knives which is a peace conference between the saxons and the britons mm. which um the the you know the Saxons famously drew out knives and um, sort of massacred the the Britons at the at the conference, um, which would have been against the British law that was in, in you know in, in mm. at the at the actual uh, event. Um, the things indispensable to a free man were his tunic, harp, and kettle. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh the indispensable vat of a vassal were his hearthstone, bill hook, and trough. So it's like these are protected items. You can't you don't mess with the man's mm. coat, don't mess with the man's trough. You know, it's uh these these um it's, it's written down that these these elements are you know it's, it would be bad. It wouldn't be cricket to uh, to to take that away from someone. Mm. Um, I guess it's your survival. Um, so you, yeah, it's like fair game. Don't touch those things. Yeah. Uh, uh, the property of a man, <clears throat> uh, property of which a man might not be deprived were his wife, children, clothes, arms, implements of the uh, implements of the privileged art a very another great indicator of uh, culture which is um very passionately protective of um produ of producing culture something we don't see today with our government um no no true it's like the complete opposite today it's it's um so the the generation of art and culture is something which the welsh understood is something which is essential. Yes, um, and and to, and to be preserved and protected. Yeah, fascinating. Um, three ornaments of a tribe were a book, a harp, and a sword. So we've got, you know, this this is you could even look at it as symbolic way there, you know. A book, you know, the that's that's strange to me to see that in there actually. Um, mm. It's something which, you know, we're often told that the the Welsh and the Britons actually 
preferred oral tradition to uh, to the written word. But anyway, it's in there. Mm. Um, a heart. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just uh, just my only thought that it's it's a it's a book. Ah, which, okay. You know, yeah. A book. <laughs> so, a, so okay. You, have, you know, if you if you if your tradition is you know entirely oral. Mm. There might be one man who's allowed to look after the book and looks at the book and puts things in the book, yeah. you know, which is uh, probably has things like genealogies in. Yeah, uh, okay, right, I'm with you. Yeah, all right. Um, and these would be like the essential things, and then, so um, yeah, I think that's. I think it's it's I think it's interesting that book is in the singular, because I think that yeah, possibly gets around what you're what you're thinking about mm. the oral. Okay. Oral yeah. aspect of the culture. Brilliant. Yeah. Right. Hereditary owner of the land could always reclaim it after sale by offering the value. Right. So you had um, first dibs on land, which was your ancestors. Mm -hmm. Which means the genealogies are very important. They, yeah, absolutely. This goes back to the gravel kind, um, yeah. in, which um, John Sadler claimed was the. Uh, one of the remnants of the Trojan um, laws in Britain. Um, so land and your ancestry are extremely important. And this is, you know, one of the uh, the, the ideas that, um, yeah, you're, you're married to the land in some, some sort of way. Um, I think that's interesting. It proves, it proves private ownership and, and tillage is, was right. Happening, you know, coexisting. I think that's really interesting. So you could you could have several classes of people operating yeah. and owning land, which I think is really interesting. Um, yeah, that's yeah. This it's it's a very very um, it's very very progressive in many ways, isn't it? Mm. Um. The chief was the oldest efficient man in the tribe. That's a really important one. This is this is all to do, all to do with um, the fitness of a king to rule, and mm. also it ties in with the Fisher King motif of um, the main. You know, a Welshman, uh, a Welsh king can't be the king, and this is you know potent. He's virile, um, mm. and it's come. It, it but it also translates to. How are you working with the land? How are you working with the people? You know, how are you offering uh, your wisdom? You can't just be a king just because you're old and you're the oldest one. It doesn't work like that. You've got to be competent and skilled as well. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, uh, the meeting of a country could be called by pro public proclamation, not only by the king or lord of the district or the chief of a tribe, but also by a family representative. So, meeting of a country. Right, mm. it's, it's like you know the the the, um, the motif of Arthur being high king of the Britons, for example, mm -hmm. is an idea which is is rooted in the British law, and that you could unite the the country. The, you know, there there was an idea that there was a country and countries within that, but it was ultimately uh, a, conf a sort of loose confederation of a people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Com Confederate states is certainly how I think about yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, there's something that I've been thinking about for a while about think about those hilltop cities of Italy of the Roman period. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, essentially, like individual city states, which <laughs> very strong theme in Italian history, right up until you know, right up until the unification. Right, yeah. and but within that. They were a shared nation, culture, language. Yeah. And then if you think about Britain, what do you have? Bloody hilltop towns, yet again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. With individual states, which seem to be share a culture, nature, uh, history. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's it's not a crazy leap. I, I, I don't. I don't understand the resistance to the idea. It's, um, you know, it's, there's always, as you say, there's always this idea to, to, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Make it seem as small, make it seem as parochial as yes. possible. You know, yeah. well, oh well, if, if if the Britons are talking about this, they're just talking about one small aspect of the country, one one small bit which they might know about. There's no internal cohesion between the states. They're always small parochial bodies of of chiefdoms, you know. But that's not what any of the history says. It's it's certainly not what the history after the sixth century suggests either. You know, by no. the end of the sixth century, you've got Saxon kings calling themselves Bretwalders, meaning oh. high, meaning high king, you know. Uh, wow. of, of britain or at least of the saxon states of britain interesting I, I i i this is you know and that is not something that they invented that is something no. that they that they no, it was a, a, an assimilation wasn't it almost it was uh an assimilate uh, um, uh replication of british law it seems you know that seems, yeah. seems very british to me yeah really cool there were three privileged conventions. The first, that the bards for sound instruction on virtue, wisdom, and hospitality to record events, actions, and pedigrees and proclaim laws. Second, that of the country and lord for court law. Third, for independence to establish harmony by mutual reason and agreement of country and country, prince and prince, vote and vote. So... There's an old uh, British Druidic axiom which says, um, "He who wants to be king must first be a bridge," uh, which seems mm. to rep re represent itself in this law, which is talking about um, finding a sweet spot between disagreements and peoples of different factions, um, which seems like a very healthy uh, sentiment. Mm. To 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 represent there it's really cool and it goes back to our previous point about they can they can have their own local political things going on yeah which are not necessary you know it's not like the whole nation goes oh this is how we're doing it that's how you're doing it it's like oh right that's your way of doing it this is our way of doing it let's try and work out something in between you know just like you were saying about sort of like loosely con confederated states you know yeah, state the state has its own power to rule itself locally. Yes, but there are certain federal laws, which which is what the the Malmutian laws are, which 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 govern and help create, um, you know, in in engender good relationships. Yeah, and engender discussion, engender you know, um, so so everyone benefits, and not just not mm -hmm. just one state or another. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and also you've got in there a kind of this this idea that the, the bardic tradition is something to be uh, preserved by all, by all means um, mm. because they can these are, these are the people who have they're, they're the lineage of uh, wise people in the country tasked with recording the memory of, of the people and and uh, therefore the the rights of of certain people and uh, you know and and mm. they were the ones tasked with um officiating that yeah that's pretty cool um the consent of the country was needed to abrogate the king's law to dethrone the sovereign and teach new sciences and new regulations in the convention of the bards so so basically you needed you needed agreement amongst the entire nation yeah before doing any of those things so if you wanted to dethrone <laughs> the sovereign everyone had to agree on it teach new sciences and new regulations in the convention of the birds you had to you had to all agree on it which is interesting to think about christianity yeah, because it meant that there had to be some sort of national agreement to instill the religion, and to instill the religion. Is that exactly? Wow. Yeah, that's quite important. brought in part of the but. So, so when people talk about the spread of Christianity in Britain, yeah, you know they always talk about it very regionally. But it, if the Malmutian laws were in in place, then 
there would have had to have been some sort of national yeah agreement on that. Yeah. So that's, that's that's interesting. That negates the regional thing definitely. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, cool. The native rights of all freeborn men and women were the gift and free use of five acres of land, uh, which is eight English acres. The carrying of arms, and a vote to a man at puberty and a woman when she marries. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's sad that the woman has to get married first, but the woman having a vote is something that we didn't have in this yeah. country at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, so that's pretty fantastic, yeah. isn't it? Abs- I mean, absolutely, yeah. It is fun. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, and, and also, um, and the women were land owning. Yeah, abs- yeah, yeah. Absolutely, this is ancient. <laughs> These are ancient. Yeah. Um, it, but it, it does. It reminds me of um, the, the marriage thing. Reminds me of uh, a law which the the bards and later the British clergymen had, which was um, they had to marry before they were they had to be married before being mm. taken seriously. So marriage is a very uh, special part of British society. Um, yeah, and and seemingly a, a, as important. Um... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? As important um, in religion. Sorry, in- <laughs> sorry, I've forgotten the word. Non-religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, it's a legal thing as well as a as well as a religious thing, religious and the, thing. the the importance of 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 law as well as a, as a, a sorry marriage as a as a legal aspect of your of your social position and your um, position mm. as a free man is not just not just uh not just about the union of of christian people for the for the benefit of procreation it's it's yes yes yeah there is uh there's a cultural and societal aspect to the marriage as well yeah uh, that's and fascinating seems inextricably linked with the stewardship of land um, yes which is uh, something which comes up again and again when looking at the ancient welsh uh, mm. way of life which is well, I can get behind that, uh, personally. Yeah. Um, I'd love it if someone gave me eight acres just for going through puberty. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be well chuffed. <laughs> I, I'd need it to uh, <laughs> drift round in it, a it, or it, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. A woman also had the privilege that if she had a son by a foreigner against her consent, as when in the power of foreigners in any way, by tribal order or accident, her son inherited as a free man, although a foreigner, uh, could not inherit his inherit privileges for free men for nine generations. So that's again uh, quite humanistic. Yeah, a, a foreigner doesn't get the same rights for nine generations. Just for contrast, to show. Um, how they they treated that sort of thing that's really interesting yeah i think i think uh it also shows why invaders were so keen to marry into yeah well families yes because their sons would get all the pr- privileges of being free men they yeah, might absolutely. not necessarily get them in welsh culture mm. but you're you're as far as they're concerned in the monmutian law your children are welsh yeah 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 absolutely brilliant I'll um, I'll put the link up for anyone who wants to just go through all of these. There's so much to go through in here, and I, and I said earlier, it doesn't really take that long. It's 28 pages, mm. 24 really. Um, but another example of how um, the arts and learning were um, treated in Britain is is visible in this one, where it says learning was greatly respected, privilege of support was given to rank to bards or teachers and to orphans. Um, so that this goes back to a, the, the the druidic thing as well, because you know the druids were non-combatants; they were exempt from paying tax and from uh, fighting. So mm. that's something that they that they retained. Um, also, that the free man must support a wife. Um, the free man must support a wife. Also, a fighting man if he does not fight himself. And of and a family tutor again the the so it's putting energy into defense 
um, slash and you know expansion, you know uh, expanding uh, efforts, and also to um, have someone to teach the children, or you know have a, a kind of input. Um, yeah, and it's like education is is a uh, is is again this is something that we didn't really get until 20th century england if, yeah. if you yeah. are a free man and you have children you must edu- you must support a tutor to educate your children yeah, your children fast. must be uh, legally must be educated <laughs> i mean yeah. that is fascinating yeah it is yeah yeah um the pr- the privileged arts gave that gave complete liberty our bardism metallurgy and learning literature uh so yeah i mean that's 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 fascinating so the idea that you you're not really an adult until you've had an education almost mm. isn't it? it's that's fascinating um metallurgy yeah interest in, in, again this is very like you know archaic you know it's, mm. it's t- teaching and learning uh, and we'll lump bardism in sort of with that and metallurgy. They are the import these those are the things that are placed with importance. Yeah. Um, I think that's you know, if you, you uh, that's sorry, I can't even get out what I'm trying to say. It seems it seems very archaic that that is the um the things that are, are, are select that pointed out metallurgy yeah literally meaning well it's alchemy could be another word yeah. for it but you you wouldn't think of a, a smith you know no. a, a, or a blacksmith as being like a well you're a protected freeman not necessarily in the later medieval period but at a time like the iron age yeah it's it's a it's a virtually a magical art you know this is it's something that's still seen with reverence or something so for me that that law arguably yeah. dates this mm. Mm. To, to 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 early you know yeah yeah absolutely um, yeah so yeah. To, to summarize then um there are there are 10 points on which uh petrie uh extracts from this and thinks is 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 um you know, you, you can take from it, which is one is that um, the British record of Caesar's attack, written in entire ignorance, is, uh, ignorance of Caesar's account, but closely according with it. Very interesting. Um, the British account was the basis of the chronicle of the kingdom of Gloucestershire, or Gloucester, sorry, uh, and passed into the history known by the name Tassilio. Uh, that the brute legend was written about the time of Claudius, that there is nothing improbable in all the relations with Rome, uh, at least down to the 5th century, as represented by Tassilio. That the statements of marvels by Geoffrey are carefully withdrawn by him from historic materials and treated as fabulous. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so number six, that there was no doubt as to the dependence of Geoffrey on water and of water on an earlier manuscript probably Breton for the British history as stated by those writers. I don't know why he's saying probably Breton because he's said quite uh, distinctly that it, it was from, you know, the yeah. manuscript was from Brittany, but um, yeah. Well, I think possibly the problem is that is that even if it was found in Brittany, it might not necessarily be a Breton manuscript. Okay, It cool. could be from Cornwall. It could from, be from Wales. And if it's from Cornwall, it would possibly be indistinguishable in terms of, it could, it could be indistinguishable in terms of language uh, from a Breton manuscript. I, that could be that could be what he's alluding to. I'm not sure. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, cool, right. Um, and seven, that the Hengist invasion is dated by Celtic sources to AD 429, and the Saxon date is in error. Um, Arthur reigned from 467 to 493, thus rendering possible the account of his French expedition. Yeah, so this is he's talking about the Magnus Maximus. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah his European campaign. Um, yeah. So, and I think this is so. This could be maybe the where this comes from of that really early date from Arthur. This could be what 
Petrie's alluding to is where where quite a lot of people they look at the European campaign, look at the Saxon campaigns, and go, if we put if we put Arthur around the middle of the you know fifth century, we can kind of get away with him fighting Romans and fighting Saxons. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think once you understand that the European campaign is an interpolation from a separate history about Andragathius, mm. Arthur I, then um, then then that it fits that dating different. changes and that yeah that doesn't yeah yeah it's, it's it's no longer an issue should we say no no yeah absolutely yeah yeah it's very I mean when I heard when I first heard that from Alan Wilson's mouth I was like. Well, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> no. you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so, cool. uh, and yeah. also, I I think if if Petrie had, had had just twigged that it was Magnus Maximus's campaign again, yeah. I think I I think he would have got that. Um, yeah, without any problem. And and he might have. He might have later down the road. Um, Absolutely, yeah. But, but he, and to be fair to him, it doesn't look like anyone else is handling this stuff in the same sort of with the same sort of. Uh, no, no so, certainly not. Certainly not in the period in question. Well, not no. in England. Maybe no. in Wales, but not in England. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. So number nine, the, the historical triads were compiled from before AD four fifty down to the twelfth century, but received no accreditations since then. So the the triads were recorded in fourteen fifty. You know, written down for the first time, I think, in fourteen fifty. Is that right? Yeah, um, uh, that sounds about right. Yeah. Sounds about right. So they're re- recorded, or at least in Latin in 1450, or, you know. In a, yeah, yeah, or English, yeah, yeah or, or English, something, yeah. yeah. And um, so so people have always speculated as to when they end. Um, and he, you know, great, you know, great bit of logic from him again. Um, there's no mention of Edward I, and I'm sure if they were writing triads. Oh, yes. yes. They would have they would have recorded uh, Mr. Longshanks. Yeah, um, probably not very nicely. <laughs> probably not very nicely, but you know, I well, mean, maybe in it. some places, you know, <laughs> yeah, down in the marches, yeah. Mm. Um, but I mean, we get loads of poetry from that time, you know. Yeah, in, in Welsh verse, so yeah, well, I'm sure, we, and the the emotion packed into some of those poems is, uh, uh, yeah, it, you know, about the the loss of Llewellyn, you know, it, it's not something that went unrecorded but I'm sure we would have had a triad if if they were writing them past that point um so number 10 is that the laws of Mulmud um show the pagan British civilization at least the early, as as early as the Roman age um mm. so this what Petrie is doing I think is he, he's taking the British nation and he's taking it to the first century. That's as far as he's taken it. He didn't want to say that the Brutus story is older than the first century. Mm. Uh, he's probably careful with that, um, but he takes it a long, longer, back, further back than anyone else does um, contemporary to him. So that's, it's really good to see that. Um, but he's also saying that the British civilization, we can definitely say from the first century is a cohesive civilization a nation that we can say you know exists from that point um which for petrie's uh class of person in britain at the time um very uh yeah aggressive um so the the present the present required uh, requirement for british history so much neglected is is a scholar in old welsh breton irish and late latin accustomed to the Paleography, who, who will deal with an with an historian and not the, with, with, as an historian and not a mythologist. So he's saying that we're dealing with history written in a way which comes across as myth, which we know, yeah. in, aren't we? So yeah. yes, and we and we need to do. It's it's about having the attitude, isn't it? The right attitude. Yeah. Absolutely. We will deal with these things as historians deal with them, not how mythologists deal yeah. with them. You know, and I think this is um, this last point as well harks back to something I missed off at the end, was that he was infuriated that he could not find copies of these things in English. Yeah, because, absolutely. 
And he was going, why hasn't anyone translated this? Why are there so few English translations of this? Mm. You know, what's going on? What are people playing? <laughs> you know, what are people playing? At? <laughs> why, why isn't this available? You know, um, he he was asking um, Welsh scholars, um, English scholars, you know, where where is the copies of this in English? And he struggled to find one, I think. Yeah. One copy. Yeah. Yeah, which is a real um, act of negligence, which is, is oh clues in the title. He's he's dealing with something which has been forgotten, yes, uh, forgotten and actively hidden in in other parts of history. Well, this is a, he 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 refers to it as negligence, doesn't he? Negligence. And I think yeah. that's yes. and that possibly maybe he was being purposefully naive. Yeah, absolutely. He might have very well known that there were political reasons for this being hidden. I, but he yeah. was just like, let's play it off as negligence. You know, let's play it, let's just say, yeah. oh, we just haven't dealt with it. Let's deal with it now in our in our modern time where we don't have to worry about archaic politics. You know, this it's, is so yeah. far removed from us now. We don't need to worry about that. I, I think let's he's just, smart. Yeah. Smart and doing <laughs> Yes, absolutely. A very smart way of going about it. Because it certainly didn't go well for Wilson and Blackett, you know, mm. to talk about the politics of this stuff. You know, they they, they got it in the neck for, for, for dealing yeah. with the political aspects of this. So, um, you know, I think maybe it's a very sensible approach that he that he's he's gone through with this. But not that it seems to have worked because yeah. they're only re just rediscovering this, you know, 100 years later. Well, I hope that some people get to see this and get some people thinking because absolutely, you know, this is why we do it. It, it this, this is Sir Flinders Petrie writing about our topic. Um, absolutely. And we can't, we can, we can just ignore it, not do anything about that. So I'm, I'm, I hope you enjoyed that folks. Yeah. And, uh, and I think uh, for those of you who only know about his Egyptology, I hope you're interested in a, in another aspect of his work. Yeah. And uh, yeah, take a look at it for yourselves because there, there's so much in it that me and Adam just haven't, you know, don't have the time to cover really. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And but it's it's all, and, and we don't want to just read it verbatim, you know. No, uh, no, no. Take a good look at it yourself and see what's in it because because this has obviously been underappreciated for a hundred years. So it's yeah. going to take more than a couple of sets of eyes to really pick everything out of it that's that's useful. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly that. All right. Yeah. Cheers, folks. <laughs>